Hello, everyone. Good evening. This is a fabulous crowd and a wonderful Friday night, unusual night for poetry at the Albany Library, but it's a very special night. We are doing this in conjunction with this is poetry at the Albany Library with Poetry Flash. We have this special venue at St. Albans Episcopal Church, for which we thank St. Albans very much. We have friends of the Albany Library to thank, as always, for their generous support of our poetry in Albany. I also would especially like to thank the staff of the library this time. This has been a big project, and uh, we, made, we made a lot of decis decisions and changes in the last minute, and everyone came through. Friends came through with great bits of help, and, and we have um, wonderful filmmaker, Jeremy. Jeremy, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your last name at this moment. Okay. <laughs> so this will be filmed. It will be available online on YouTube and possibly on Albany's cable station as well. So, all right, so I'd like to introduce first Richard Silberg of Poetry Flash. We have both Joyce Jenkins and Richard Silberg here. We are co-hosting this evening. Richard is co-editor of Poetry Flash and hosts the poetry series through Poetry Flash is a fabulous teacher and well-awarded poet himself. Very happy to have him here. Well, first of all, uh, I want to uh, congratulate Catherine, Catherine Taylor, who has done such a fabulous uh, job of of her series at uh, the Albany Library and uh, bringing Gerald Stern out to have uh, Robert Hass introducing, not bad. <laughs> now I am introducing Robert Hass. And as we all know, he is uh, he's a key poet of his generation. Obviously, six, six books of poems that have won every prize that, uh, that matters. Um, it's probably less known, a little less known, what a wonderful essay essayist he is. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, he published a really a delicious book, a book that I read like candy, uh, 20th Century Pleasures, that uh, won a National Book Circle, I can never say that right, National Book Circle Critics Award. You get the idea. And uh, he, has, uh, he has a new book, a bigger book, about twice the size, What Light Can Do. Uh, which is, is uh, the, the first book was literary writing. This has all that, uh, that brilliance of uh, literary appreciation, but it also is uh, nature writing, there's some memoir, and there's uh, photography there, which is where it gets its title. There are some essays on photography. And uh, Bob, of course, was our first uh, United States Poet Laureate from the Hood. Uh, <laughs> he was, I believe, the first even from the West. But what I really, what I really want to say is uh, he, his specialness is an open, receptive, generous mind. Uh, there are lots of brilliant people around and uh, they often try to be brilliant. They want to impress or uh, overawe, even browbeat, or maybe talk across to you in an arcane language. But Bob uh, begins at a human center he always is right there with his uh, 
audience or uh, with his readership. And he, um, I fully expect him to have uh, things of genuine interest. I expect him to, uh, to shed light and open some new dimensions on the demonic jerriness we are about to experience. <laughs> so Robert has. So Jerry, in Berkeley and in Northern California, we show you we love you by giving the introducer an introduction. That's what we do. Um, thank you, Richard. You probably all know that we're in the presence tonight of one of the amazing musical instruments of the North American continent. I think it's what you showed up for. Jerry Stern was born in February 1925 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to immigrant parents from Chernovich, which was, is now part of the Ukraine, was then part of the Russian Empire, 1925 to 1935 when he was a kid. Pittsburgh must have still been the steel town, industrial, gritty, wealthy, be dramatically beautiful setting for a city. Um, he graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in 1947. He went to New York and got an MA in 1949. And here's the, here's the Gerald Stern story from the point of view of a slightly younger generation of poets. He published his first book of poems in 1972. 1949, 1972. But with a small press so that it didn't really get much attention and then he published a few more of these early poems the next year in another book. And then in 1971, he published a book with the New York publisher, 1977, it was really his debut volume, 1925, 1977. I was saying to him, what the hell were you doing all those years? And I got part of the story tonight at dinner. One of the things he was doing was uh, directing a program at a, a community college in uh, New Jersey and heading the department and heading the union and having the first set of negotiations to give justice to adjunct professors of English. <laughs> so Jerry, who was at Columbia at the same time as Allen Ginsberg, because he kind of published his first book in 19, I published my first book in 1973. So he felt like, has always felt like, he was at once an elder and also a member of our generation of poets, which has worked out well because he's still going strong. Um, he's published 20 books of poems, four books of essays. When Lucky Life appeared, by then the landscape of his generation of poets had been kind of clear. Here was the Black Mountain poets and here was the New York School poets and here was the beat poets and here were the new formal, the old formalists and he didn't fit into any of those categories. He didn't, there wasn't any place to place him and what took people about those first three books when he started, he's pretty much cleared the table of American literary prizes and he started with those, with those books. It, I think what people talked about and what I remember being struck by was uh, the incredible exuberance of the, of the books. Their wit and generosity and warmth and humor and, um, and humanity I, is the word you want to use and use carefully because it sounds like um, so, so easy to say. And my experience of reading those books, and I think it was everybody else's, was to be thrilled at first and then, and then to, uh, hear into them a little deeper and get a feeling you thought that someone was writing about the joy of life and then you noticed that he was writing about the horror, cruelty, sorrow, beauty, and joy of life like a man madly playing deeply unhappy music on a piano with enormous happiness. <laughs> and it was the enormous happiness of the, of the speech, whether this 
I don't think you were silent during those years, but whether whatever was building up during those years came came in flood, and it came in a flood of a complexity of that I think it was hard for people to hear. I think he, in a way, got celebrated for being a new neo-American Jewish 20th century Whitman, and he's, well, Whitman is a darker than he seems, too, but these were darker and more gorgeous poems, and he went on uh, to write poems of increasing beauty, complexity. I was thinking, Jerry, of something that Christopher Smart said, the madman 18th century poet said from the asylum, I was, uh, my character made me a quester after beauty and God told me to go hunt for pearls in the sea. Your poems, right? Um, I, I went to look at the early poems to see what he was doing in those 20 years or 15 years when the poems weren't being published. And one of the things he was doing was uh, studying English poetry. I'm pretty sure you're not gonna read this. So this is the third poem that he, in his first book. This is Lord Herbert moaning and sighing over his lost manuscripts. This is meek old Blake wandering down the street with his wolf's face on. Lamb, lamb is a master, Marvel, Sydney, beautiful, beautiful, a whole world of lucid and suffering poets talking to themselves. I dream almost steadily now of interpenetration, but not with beasts. I've had that for 20 years. That's what he's been doing for the, did I tell you he's in the Air Force for part of this time, the American Air Force? Um, so I, he's had enough of interpenetration with beasts. I've had that for 20 years. I begin with sanity now. I always begin with sanity. 1972, the beginning of this explosion of this man's enormous gift to us. Please, with love from all of us, Jerry, welcome Gerald Stern. also told that this has to be over my left shoulder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to read from three sources. <laughs> I'm going to read a few poems <laughs> from my last book called In Beauty Bright, <laughs> which hopefully is for sale someplace or other <laughs> in this lovely church. <laughs> and then I'm going to read from my new book, which came out a couple of weeks ago called Divine Nothingness. And then I'm gonna read from one of the, from a five, five or so of the poems, I've, of the 60 poems I've written since the publication, or since the, uh, since the acceptance of the manuscript of Divine Nothingness. Can you all hear me? I'm standing too far away, no, I'm okay. This is so professional. All right, let's put this away. I'll come to this later. I was saying to a friend at supper, in fact, we had a great supper with a bunch of friends, that it was easy when you first start out as a poet, you have eight poems or 12 poems, and you read all 12 poems, and that's your reading. And now I've got all these crazy books. I can't remember their titles. They're like lost children. <laughs> so, you know, I read whatever I'm doing at the time. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to spend most of the time, I, I, I was told, I, one thing I hate is after a reading for someone to come up to me, is there a problem? <laughs> You're going like that. I'm too loud, I'm too soft. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Oh, a light. 
You know, you know what Goethe said, don't you? <laughs> mehr Licht, mehr Licht. <laughs> In fact, I could talk for an hour about what people said before they died. <laughs> Oscar Wilde was the very best. He said, um, somebody must do something for the, about that wallpaper. Who? <laughs> I like Oscar Wilde. And if we had time, I would recite to you the Ballad of Reading Jail. <laughs> which is one of the first poems I ever read. Okay, can you hear me okay? I'm everything okay? Yeah. People keep coming up here trying to steal my act. <laughs> Who are you? Are you a poet? Did you suffer like I did? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm reading now about five poems from In Beauty Bright. Um... Let's see, I'm going to read a poem about Pablo Casals, a very short poem, um, whom I heard play in southern France, southernmost France in the Pyrenees, when he broke his vow of silence in protest against the fascist pig, Franco. Uh, and he played in France, and there were hundreds, thousands of people there, and they were in trailers, and they all came down to this church, and I came in with, somewhat corruptly, with a press corps, with a fake identification, and sat about as far from him as you are from me. He was a very little guy, and an extraordinary musician. And we spent a week there, I was with some friends, some of whom became enemies, and it's in here, here it is. You could either go back to the Canary, or you could listen to Bach's unaccompanied suites, for which in both cases you would have the same sofa, and you will be provided with a zigzag quilt to sleep under, and a glass-topped table and great fury, for out of those three things, music comes. Nor should you sleep if even the round muscles below the neck fall loose from their stringy moorings, for you would miss a sob, and you would miss a melody a la red canary, and a la white as well, and a la canary, perched as the cello was on top of a wooden box, and a small musician perched on top of the cello and every night, a church full of wild canaries. And then I will follow that with um, another second poem from this book. <laughs> uh, let's see. May I read a poem about Eleanor Roosevelt? I hadn't planned on doing that, but I think I should do that. Dear Eleanor, how many have seen the Roosevelt's that uh, movie, the TV film? Okay, so you know, if you didn't know before, a little bit about her. <laughs> Um, I loved her as a boy. I read, I, I was the only boy of 15 that read her column, My Day, Every Day. <laughs> I challenge the world to disprove that. <laughs> 37. 37, where are you? You'll never come back again. She kept, okay, this takes place at a restaurant at number one Fifth Avenue. And it used to be the most desirable place to live in New York. And she lived there. And so did the, um, I think the vice president lived there too. And they, no, he didn't. He came up in a DeSoto, as I say in the poem. And they came in to plan how, how to make Franklin a little more liberal, even sometimes radical. She kept dropping her papers in front of number one fifth, which first started when she got out of a yellow DeSoto, and it was either a head waiter or a doorman who rushed out to pick them up and help her into the lobby, where Henry Wallace was waiting. And you should know that though she hated his theory of eggs, she sided with him on other things, and it was Franklin they discussed, and it was the age of the seesaw and the cardboard shoe. And both of them screamed with laughter at Oysters Rockefeller. Just imagine naming food for him. How about calling soup cream of Carnegie? 
How about putting your canines to work on fried frick or chopped harriman? And God, they hated Cardinal Spellman even before he was the priest of war and of free busing. And both of them loved the Buddha and listened together to the sound of the Mineta Creek suddenly surfacing in the lobby across the street, number two. And they stood back to back to see who was taller. And everywhere in America, boys of 15 read her column before they read the funnies and put her picture beside the one of their maternal grandmothers, though girls were more rare, except a few, and Adley loved her, and Harry, and Lyndon, and in the Church of the Ascension, in front of the John Lafargue, or back of the sculpted angel, she shook hands and half bent down the way a tall woman does to kiss someone. It could be any century, and it could be her friend or a loving stranger, a former slave, or a boy of 15. What? And a, a slave could have been alive in, I don't know what, what year I'm referring to. If Henry Wallace were vice president still, it would have been uh, in the um, late 30s, I guess. Am I not right? He, he did run for president in 48, didn't he? It would be in the 40s, yes. You do know he ran for president. And that uh, you, you didn't know, though, that I was arrested by, by the police in Pittsburgh for being a communist because I went to a Henry Wallace meeting when I was uh, 18 years old. Uh, so much for the police. At least they didn't shoot me. <laughs> And they tried to, but the gun wouldn't work. <laughs> well, that was Pittsburgh police. Police are nice everywhere else. I'm sure on the West Coast they're wonderful. Um, I'm going to read a, a little song called Frogs. It's on page 55. <laughs> and this takes us back to biology class in the 10th grade, in a way. The part that we avoided was not the heart, but what we called the pouch, for it still swelled or seemed to, and there was plenty of horror cutting into what made the music, or at least the agency, you might call it, and more than one of us retched, and as you know, that can become contagious. Think of a room full of pouches exploding. Think of the music on a summer night with no one conducting and think of how warm it might be and how love songs may have gotten started there. <laughs> okay. Speaking of Frick, I will read a short poem called Died in the Mills. Uh, Frick was in power during the Homestead Steel Strike and such. And he was one of the meanest bastards in history. <laughs> And uh, he wouldn't budge. When uh, somebody died in an accident in one of the mills in Pittsburgh, uh, they gave him a little money, depending on their place of origin and um, length of service, which is only fair. Then $50 for a Hungarian, say a black dress to go to the funeral, and shoes with soles. For the three oldest, that leaves a dollar fifty for the feast. But I say, what a dollar was worth then, you could have a necktie if you wanted, and paprikash for twenty or thirty, and strudel with apples and nuts and violins. He favored the violin, and it is not just poets who love meadows and take their sneakers off and their socks to walk on the warm rocks and dip their tender white feet in the burning, freezing water, and then bend down precariously to pick up a froglet and sight the farthest lonely tree and note the wind moving quickly through the grasses their last summer. I'm going to read a poem that f features um, um, Whitman. 
I have several poems about Whitman. He lived his last days in Camden on Mickle Street. And people would come to visit him. I know Oscar Wilde came to visit him. And Swinburne came to visit him. He was famous in England before he was in America. So let me take the time to read us a slightly longer poem, not that much. It's on page 71. There were packs of dogs to deal with and broomsticks whacking rubber balls and everyone stopping for aeroplanes and chasing fire engines and standing around where sidewalks on hills turned almost level and horses and horse shit and ice in the cellars. And Saturday I wore a dark suit and leaned against my pillar and Sunday I put on a necktie and stood in front of a drugstore eating a Clark bar. The 4th of July I stayed in my attic resting in filthy cardboard and played with my bats. I stretched their bony wings and put a burning match to the bundle of papers, especially to the ropes that held them together and read the yellow news as it went up in smoke and spoke for the fly and raged against the spider, say what you will, and started my drive to Camden to look at the house on Mickle Street and walked with him down to the river to skip some stones since Ty Cobb did it and Jim Thorpe did it, though it was nothing compared to George Washington throwing silver dollars. And for our fireworks, we found some brown beer bottles and ran down Third Street screaming but he had to go back home and sit in his rocking chair for there was a crowd of Lithuanians coming and he was a big hit in Vilnius. The way he sat in his mound of papers and gripped the arms. Though I was tired of Lithuanians who didn't know shit, not to mention Romanians to pick a country out of a hat. Or I was just tired and Anne Marie was right. I shouldn't be driving at night, I should be dead I don't even know how to give instructions. I don't even know my rabbi's name, she and her motorcycle. Imagine them speaking Babylonian over my shoebox. Imagine them throwing flowers, fleabane, black-eyed Susan's daisies, along with the dirt. Aramaic, you know, is the language that the Babylonians spoke. And Aramaic is the prayer, is the, is the language that the prayer for the dead is said in. If you know, how many know that? I know Willis knows that. Willis Barnstone sitting over there. All right, maybe I'll read one more poem from this book. <laughs> if I can find one. Well, I'll read one called, I have to read two more, called Day of Grief. Now I'm going to read a one called Plaster Pig. Plaster Pig. I have a, my living room is like a little little zoo. I have various animals and st metal and plaster and so on, 107. It didn't work that the boars I grew up with smeared my door with lard, for I was enlightened and walked with the rest in the mountains of Italy on Easter morning and went to St. John's on Christmas Eve. And neither does anyone I know keep a plaster pig in his living room, for it is not what goes into the snout, and you will forgive me whether you like it or not, for wasn't it being afraid of the pig that drove us there in the first place? And wasn't it God in the second? And it had bristles in the third? And the lungs were too small? And it was as smart as a fox terrier and lived in shit? And it turns wild in a second like nothing else? And someone once told me the male has a cock that twists around like a corkscrew. And for those reasons, I won't eat it. <laughs> I'll read the last poem in this book. It's called Lowness. It was me who took a small white fiat out of my briefcase to let it breathe. And after a second, started it by gathering speed with my left foot and hopping into the seat and giving it gas, as I remember and driving or pushing it into a Rolls-Royce garage in Edison to get it repaired, which I think compares to riding a donkey into St. John's 
or a scooter into the great lobby of Temple Emmanuel, which partly explains, but I don't understand it, and I'm embarrassed on the donkey's back, holding onto his mane, or running beside that scooter and hopping on on Fifth Avenue, for I mean it and don't mean it, though more likely I would do either, I would do both, for I am a spy on myself, and it's no little thing forgiving bastards and loving lowness and driving a Fiat 500, 300 pounds alongside a giant truck for the sake of a little decency. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read a few poems from my new book, Divine Nothingness, by Gerald Stern. <laughs> I'll start with a poem about an ex-girlfriend whose first name was Ruth. <laughs> and I, you know, she married some idiot. <laughs> uh, it's a long story. I've written many poems about her. But, uh, you know, towards the end, uh, a, few, a year or two ago, I was wondering what happened to Ruth. <laughs> she was a social worker. She started a union in Pittsburgh and, and was blackballed from working in the city and social work. She was a social worker. And um, I finally found out, because I was looking for her maiden name, Ruth Middleman, uh, Ruth Rosenblum, and it was her married name. It came up that she died of emphysema a week before I found the, uh, the evidence. So this is a poem for Ruth, wherever she is, 23 or whatever she is. There was a way I could find out if Ruth were still alive, but it said nothing about her 46 Mercury, nor how the gear shift ruined our making love, nor how her brother found her compromised, and what the contempt was he registered. Though I wanted to remember the 200 steps I climbed and the first kisses in the empty kitchen, a lifetime before she died of emphysema, and all her credits were spread out on a page in what they called an almanac, for which I chose to walk uphill for a half hour until I reached a house with a blue boat in the front yard, then walk back down, for downhill you are relieved since you have a whole city below you, and you have the wind at your back for consolation and a small porcupine at home in the empty street and hunched over eating a rotten cabbage since grief is your subject. In Miami Beach, when they were first building it up in the late 20s and 30s, these little, little um, uh, what were they called, uh, that style of architecture? Art Dreco, <laughs> Art Dreco, um, and it was built specifically for nor northeastern Jews to come live cheaply. It really was, and of course the old boys in Florida didn't like that, and and uh, they're still running Florida, the old boys, and they, there were signs in hotels, and I have this is absolutely true. No Jews or dogs. <laughs> Although what they had against dogs, I, I just don't know. <laughs> but here's a poem called Dolly, which was a name of a dog I once had. It's true that in spite of the sign that said no dogs or else, I was offered a room under the weather vane where the arrow's shadow came and went and there was a mattress against the wall, boxes of records and cartons of light bulbs, and Dolly, whom I hid in a shopping bag, only allowed herself to whimper, for dogs know when it's time to hide, and for all I know, can read our miserable signs. And what you do with a dog in a shopping bag, you can gently hold her mouth shut, for she wants to bark, and that would ruin your nap on the filthy mattress, and later your swim. And most of all, near the ivy and the beech plum, 
the race to restore knowledge with a stick. Okay, I'll read a poem called Love, page 38. I've never read this one to a group before. A wet towel so many times you'd think I'd finally get it. Say the day I reached into my pocket for 250 with nothing in writing and 40 more for the paint, though it was more for Jack Daniels and Jim Beam. Or say the day I made the mortgage payments to save a house and made an agreement for working against the money involving receipts and deadlines, but both were ignored, and who paid the next month's mortgage? There's no way of knowing. But money is only water, isn't it? And everything rises and falls, and somehow it's only smoke. But the poor, poor reach down on the sidewalk for a penny. Bohemians, too, they know exactly what's in their pockets, down to the dollar, for they are provident, unlike the bastards who don't need pockets, since the tailors cut their pants without to give a smooth, ferocious look like the czarist police or the corporate piggery eating and vomiting. And one time I picked up a soul near Easton, PA, and drove him down to my house and cooked an omelet you can't imagine with big boy tomatoes out of our garden and new potatoes and drove him down, downstream to catch a bus to Philadelphia and probably gave him 20 bucks besides a day of hopeless amour on the Delaware. <laughs> a little poem but it takes place in my city, Lambertville, New Jersey, called Wilderness. Given how dear are pests now, you think it was no big thing watching one run up Union Street at six in the morning in the middle of town looking for a woods though he may have smelled the river, which only confused him. At least that's what I think. And he turned right on Jefferson toward the hills, if you consider the corner where an impatient woman was running in place. And we went softly in different directions, for we were too ashamed to look at each other. <laughs> A poem called Not Me. This happens to be my favorite poem in this book. I don't know if you have favorite poems from your books, it's a weird, weird concept, really. <laughs> it wasn't me, but someone else in his 80s sitting against a wall. And it had to be his mother sitting beside him, well over a 100 and maybe blind, I couldn't tell, and feeding her from a tin plate, or maybe it was foil of some kind, I don't remember. And when a small girl Maybe three or four came by in tan stockings with horizontal blue stripes and new blue shoes and sunglasses, I remember. It could have been Crete, Heraklion, I'm sure of it. He, star he stared in disbelief, maybe in envy, maybe even in joy, and turned to his mother to whisper something and folded his stiff fingers over his belly and broke out into a smile and half closed his eyes and almost nodded. There were so many decades between them, he could have slapped the ground with gratitude. <laughs> okay, I'll read two more poems from this book so you have a chance to read it on your own. I'll read a poem called uh, He Who Is Filthy and I'll end with a poem called Life Watch, as opposed to Death Watch, 102. <laughs> this has reference to Johnny Cash, who, who stealing from um, Revelations, <laughs> from John's Revelation, some lines, uh, wrote the, a beautiful song, he who is filthy will be filthy still, and so on. He who has a forehead will have a forehead still, and she who has a little brown egg will have her nest and give her milk in the most unlikely place of all. 
and Johnny Cash will sit with his hand on one leg in his other hand holding his head up and learned Cohen will get on his knees before his brilliant violinist and he who is filthy will be filthy still and most of all Thelonious Monk will turn around again and again a different tick from mine but equally respectable. The proofreader at my publishing house, when I, when he had the manuscript, said, "You certainly mean Leonard Cohn, don't you mean? You don't mean Le Learned Cohn?" And I said, "No, I mean Learned Cohn, as in Learned Hand, you know." And I'll end up in this book, and then I'll read some recent poems. This is called Life Watch. Good to lie down in a yard of shadowing bimbo trees against a dying redbud near a Japanese maple whose deliquescent branches year by year it gets darker and darker. Good to be near a fence which unlike its neighbors both up and down it's all of wire a see-through chain link different from the wooden walls the jails nearby the swimming pools and sling chairs. Good to be here finally, filling in the gaps and drinking coconut milk again and out of debt forever. So I don't know what time I got started. What time is it? It's, uh, I'm okay. I declare that I'm okay. <laughs> I, I took a vote, an internal vote, and the yeas won, or the nays won, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But one party won. Bob has talked about how I didn't write till, didn't publish till relatively late, though I was writing poetry when I was 14 and 15. I was my own, my own worst or best critic. And instead of publishing my first two books and then finally publishing some real poetry, I buried my books in my attic or in my head. Uh, so let me read some recent stuff. And so I was saying that not in terms of what he said in his beautiful introduction, but um, I'm talking about the fact that I'm writing intensely now. I have 60 new poems since the publication of that book or since my sending it to my editor. I don't know what to do. I can't give her, this book just came out two weeks ago. I can't <laughs> say, hey, I got another book for you. And you're not allowed to change companies <laughs> if you're a poet, <laughs> and so on. So life is difficult for us poor poets. <laughs> this, is, this poem is called Bastards, and uh, it, cel it celebrates a uh, time, 1950, when the lights were finally turned on in Paris after it being the city of lights, you understand, <laughs> after it was dark from 1939 to... 1950, and the whole city was out walking, and I ran, ran across a friend of mine, a cello player named Sable Kliatschko, with a very lovely woman who I apologize, but I had started talking to him, we sort of moved into a side street and such. If you were the bastard, it doesn't matter what the blossoms were, nor if you were a frog, you could or could not sleep in the azaleas nor what the fireworks were like July 14th, 1950, the first day they turned the lights on after 11 years, or if you put her in a taxi afterwards, not even if you trained to be a doctor and spread kindness in a hundred places, not even if you walked all night, not even cellos mattered if you were the bastard. A, poem, a short poem called Cuckoo Land. There is nothing like a Hebrew when it comes to cuckoo land. Given the dreamland starting with Blue Mountain and ending with a swamp drained of dead alligators. You pick the place, Chicago, New York, L.A. I'll take the swamp and the 960 historical buildings, the Art Greco hotels, and the great fig tree, too, for I go back a while, and I'm also a Hebrew. 
This is a poem about Easter. I read the day before yesterday at a Jesuit, wonderful, beautiful college, it's a Jesuit college, and I said, what's Easter about? Nobody wanted to answer. I'm sure they knew. <laughs> Today it's Easter and there are black flags all over all the porches. Down the street someone put up an American flag. He thought it was the 4th of July. My favorite stores are closed. Everyone's at the funeral. In Disney Town, there's a church that looks a lot like St. Peter's. And there's a new pope there, a woman named Frances. In the days of Pius, her name was Billy. She's giving a sermon to 900,000 people in the sunshine. Eat what you kill. Kill what you eat. Love what you kill. I forget. I can't find a black flag for I'm no longer an anarchist. I'm a liberal, radical, East Coast, socialist, profit-adoring, Debs-loving Yid, like him. <laughs> you understand that Debs ran for president against Wilson and he, on the socialist ticket while, while he was in jail for opposing war, World War I, and he got almost two million Votes. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days, my love. -da -da -dee -da -da. This poem is called Perish of the Day. It's taken from Job. Perish the day on which I was born. And it's a, a poem that has the, the, the memory of Larry Levis all over it whom I adored, Larry Levis, who loved horses, among other things. I heard tonight at dinner that his family owned a, that they raised grapes. I didn't know that. And if you have not read Larry Levis, read his poems. He died at 49 in Richmond, probably from taking a hot bath after he uh, sniffed some cocaine. Bad way to die. It's not just Larry who keeps going to meetings when there's no one there. I went to one in the latrine where a body was hanging from a pipe and a finger had written in vapor, just a warning. But whoever dragged him in forgot to take his boots off before or after. And there was only one person there, one live person, and he was cleaning the toilet with Ajax, the magic cleanser. And he had an Irish accent mixed with English. I myself heard in Scotland the name Glaswegian. So, so that makes two. When in walks Larry, and then for an hour or more, he and Jonathan Swift, the Ajax man, talked horses. And as he said, an angel disguised as a fly flew into the ear, then into the brain of the horse. You should watch where you put the swab, and you should scratch the smooth skin closest to the skull so your hand can slip onto the horse's head, which he would shake free and move along the fence so he could bend down for new weed. And as for the meeting, it lasted just long enough to cut the dead man down and wash him off but it was hard getting the boots off without cutting or snipping, for there were no laces. That's what I want to say. There were no laces on the day we unhanged him. This is a poem called Lips. <laughs> I played the trombone in junior high school until my neighbors uh, wrote a little thing about, you know, you have to stop playing the trombone. I used to play uh, Pennies from Heaven. Don't you know each cloud contains pennies from heaven? You'll find your fortune falling. And so on. Sitting with his friends, he learned how shameful it was to have played the golden trombone and not the wooden flute and to have blasted his own way into manhood that way 
instead of making a soft sound with his mouth and fingers. But he was stubborn, and anyhow, he had thick lips, which stood him in good stead in one case, but not the other. And furthermore, his friends had died, one, two, three, one after another, and he was left to his own devices, I would say his own instruments. He could have considered a harp, or in his case, a lyre, and found a tall stool to display his wares. I haven't forgotten that, for he wasn't finally restricted to one thing. Indeed, a mouth organ, if push comes to shove, something he could almost swallow for the drama's sake. Think of him getting rid of spit and warming up behind the French horns, the French horns he hated beyond anything for their thin lips and their benevolent sounds. Uh, I did want to read a poem tonight uh, for, uh, um, for Galway Canal, or a poem written by Galway Canal, who died last week, as uh, the members of my generation just die one, two, three, like that, and there are very few of us left. And um, Bob and I were talking about it, about how we received the information when my partner, Anne Marie, told me I burst into tears for I loved him so. And he was such a dear man and such a generous human being and such a great poet. And I, took, I brought with me his last poem um, called, the, what was the title? I was trying to, Astonishment. And I, I forgot to bring it. I brought something else instead. But I do want to mention him and what a great poet he was and how he lay, lay for months in his living room on a hospital bed not able to recognize even his dear wife, Bobby. And um, another member, another poet from my generation uh, who is stricken, and many of them have been stricken, some, ex some extremely stricken, if you will. Um, Robert Bly has been stricken. Bill William Merwin, a dear friend of mine, uh, can no longer see. And he, he loved dogs, William. He loved them. And uh, I wrote a poem for him just a couple weeks ago um, about how we were walking in the 80s, in the early 80s in New York, and we carried, everybody carried jackets full of quarters to give to poor people and homeless people. And we gave a couple quarters to this one and that one. And there was a guy walking with a dog, and we gave him money. And suddenly William, who was thinking about it, not listening to me lecturing, ran back a block, a city block, to give some more money to the man because he had a dog with him. And then one more, one more story about dogs and William. Uh, I wrote a poem about the, a, a dead dog talking, and it was called The Dog. And uh, I wrote it in Alabama, I remember. And um, there was a poetry festival, and there were 2,000 people in a tent. And it was night, and I suddenly forgot to piss. The word pee is a euphemism for piss. Uh, and I quietly was walking up the aisle to go outside. And William said, this poem is for Jerry Stern. Is he around anywhere? <laughs> the way it was in the 80s when we carried pockets full of quarters to give to the destitute. And William ran a whole block south once to give extra quarters because of the man's dog, a second giving for him. And it was his own child he mourned for weeks on end, and how delighted he was and shocked to see the child next door with his characteristic blue tongue and his proud and distant way, so that now in the time of no age that we share together 
though across six hours of land and six or more hours of water. I think of him writing in his room full of white light, as our friend Mary Ann describes it, where he's loading his pockets and he will run down the best he can to give a second time to the man with a border collie, though it's more like a third time now that I think of it. And I'll end up with a poem, uh, and then I'll talk to you if you want me to for a few minutes. I mean, I'll let you talk, or if you have a comment to make, or even a question to ask, or, or a request a poem of any kind, or is there something puzzling that overwhelming you. This is called Galaxy Love. There's too little time left to measure the space between us, for that was long ago that time. So just lie under the dark blue quilt and put the fat pillows with the blue slips on the great windowsill so we can look over them and down to the small, to the small figures hurrying by in total silence. And think of the heat up here and the cold down there while I turn the light off with the right hand and gather you in close with the wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's so sweet. So we've got a few minutes in case anybody has an intelligent comment to make or even, <laughs> even a stupid one. I love stupid comments. I make them all the time. Does anybody want to talk? Just raise your hand as if you're in class. Did I hear a sound? Yes. Have I ever written a limerick? <laughs> yeah, I've written dozens of limericks and I make them up and I don't remember anyone. There once was a girl from Madras who had a magnificent ass. T'was not round and pink, as you probably think, but was brown, had long ears, and ate grass. <laughs> That's one I made up years ago. <laughs> That's a strange question. <laughs> Have you ever written a limerick? Well, who's, the, who's the person that asked that question? Have, she's hiding. Are you, have you ever written a limerick? It took me years to know how to pronounce that. I thought it was lime rick. <laughs> so there's so many people here I know, and I'm so grateful you came to this reading. And it makes me feel so good. I want you to know how you feel up here. And I feel like preaching, you know, now that <laughs> <laughs> near a cross. So is there any more comments? I feel we should talk about something. Not beside the weather, I mean. Yes, 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 yes. You, I'm not sure the music in poetry or music and poetry. It, it, it's a subject that poets talk a lot about musicians. I don't think much talk about it at all. <laughs> um, and, you know, the music comes in different ways and from different sources. I recently read in a, in a biography of William Carlos Williams that at bread loaf, commonly called meat loaf, <laughs> um, Robert Frost, the great poet, who, who went there every year, almost founded the place, told his students that the, the new poet that was invited that year, William Carlos Williams, really wasn't much of a poet and you shouldn't go to his reading. And that, that was kind of surprising, for Williams had his own kind of music, as Frost had his, as Yeats had his. And sometimes the music is even contained in the statement, in the message, if you will. Sometimes it's, it, sometimes it's in the repetition, and it's so hard to talk about. It's, it's certainly never something that accompanies the poem. It's a part of the poem. And it's hard to talk about the music. 
and it's something you do invisibly. At least I do. I never much pay attention to the issue, though really I'm always paying only attention to the issue of, of music. But I do it without calling attention to it to myself, for I'm called upon to make a little sermon, so to speak. I'm talking to myself. And there, there have been times in poetry of English, in English literature, when the music was exquisite, and it was based in part on certain forms. Um, and there's been other times when the verse has been what we call free, um, uncontrolled by formal elements, and thus Frost with his music and William Carlos Williams with his exquisite music. So I don't know what else to say about it. I guess it's the kind of thing that you, 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 you go to AWP and there's a, a panel <laughs> on music and it's utterly boring. I went to a panel once at AWP when I used to go to AWP on birds. And everybody got up and talked about birds. Birds and poetry, I guess it was. And the person who was in charge was not supposed to give a lecture, but she did for about 40 minutes about birds and music. And finally, when it came my turn, I, was, I said, I'm not going to talk about birds and music because it's enough. You don't want to hear anymore. I'm going to sing some, some songs about birds uh, and poetry. And so I sang particularly some World War II songs. <laughs> There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after. Tomorrow, is that about birds? Tomorrow, just you wait and see. Now, I don't think that's one of the bird songs. <laughs> but there were all kinds of bird songs, which I sang. And the, the woman in charge said to, to Anne Marie, I guess he thinks he can do anything he wants. And she said, yes, he does. <laughs> that's a good question. It really is a good question and something to pursue. And I'm doing it seriously how much it helps you to read what poets say or critics say about music and poetry, I don't know. I don't know if that's even valuable, quite frankly. You must, you must go to the races yourself and bet on your own horse. All right, thank you so much. By, oh, somebody, yes, wait, 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 wait. We have one more, Mr. Frank, yes. Read you one more poem. That would be a joy. I'll read you one more poem. <laughs> There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after. I have to say, I can't find the Book of Brightness anywhere. Not Amazon, not even the library at Princeton. Though I almost scream at the librarian, it was carried across the border from Provence into Spain, Portugal, and tied with hemp under the warm saddle of the wisest donkey east and north of Madrid. And for herself, I show her my ten fingers and explain the separations and what the messages were and how the years of baseball had interfered through breakage and swelling now permanent and how there are 10 candles waiting to be lit, and what the permutations and distortions were, and how I wasn't crazy, but had to find the book to round out my education, and I was losing faith in Princeton, what with the shoes and dresses in the windows, and I could have gotten in touch with the unfathomable if only Princeton had it, and I gave her the title in Hebrew as well as a short lecture and what came out of what, but I had to go through the glass doors with nothing but an egg sandwich wrapped in plastic, the way it used to be wrapped in wax paper, and either go down to Trenton or figure out the permutations by myself. And I blamed Allen Ginsberg for all this, <laughs> since I know they had the book of pure suffering written in the same century as the brightness.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're so extraordinarily kind.